Um, as cybersecurity specialists that we are, um, there might be uh, a scenario. Let's say you're the only cybersecurity person in your organization and um, there's something you needed to do, right? Uh, maybe your boss or your team lead or the person you're reporting to gave you a task that he wants you to create uh, an I am for a particular data on the company's assets, but you you want a few people maybe give you their, their email address or uh, their username. You want only these authorized people to have access to these resources, this uh, sensitive data. How are you going to do it? What's the first thinking? Like, what would be the first thought that is going to come into your head? Right? You want, you have some a network resources and you want to restrict it to some specific people. That means you need to have some sort of um, identity and access management in on those data. And this is where I am constantly, right? So I am at, at just a um, set of policies. And also, they're not just policies alone, they're also technologies that allow you to manage and control access to specific resources. So those resources now can be your database, it can be um, a software you use internally, it can be external software, it can be your files, or it can even be your network. What I am is going to help you do is, it's going to help you create and manage user accounts with I am, you will be able to set up different group for specific access permission. And you will also be able to enforce um, security policies to ensure that only those people that you specify, only those people that you've um, set up to have access to those resources, have access to them. So let's say, for example, um, let's say you work for a company because they handle sensitive information, right? And um, the, the organization or the board of management want only doctors and nurses to have access to patients uh, electronic medical records that you have in your database. So you can use IAM to create a user account for the doc for the doctors and the nurses and assign them specific permission to access those patient records, those electrical electronic medical records. Other people would not be able to access them because they don't have that permission. So that is the use of IAM. So IAM is helping you manage um, the net, those network resources or those, um, those network infrastructure that houses those critical information that you want to keep safe. Then it is now, you'll now be able to create user accounts that can manage them. So managing those resources depends on what you even want them to do on those resources. We'll still talk about that later. So uh, if you are tasked to, uh, to set up a, an IAM rule for your organization, maybe on specific resources, the first thing you want to do is you need to know the resources you want to protect. Is it an application? Is it a database? Or is it um, just a network resource? Maybe a file in the file server or whatsoever it might be. So you need to identify that first. You need to now, after identifying them, you need to now know the people that should have access to those. So after you've done that, there are so many platforms you can uh, that actually offer IAM as a service. There's an IAM platform on GCP. It's called Google Cloud IAM. There's one on AWS. There's AWS Identity and Access Management System or so. And Microsoft as well also has one. Right. So for Microsoft as well, they still use their uh, Microsoft Active Directory. So it just depends on what you need the IAM platform for. So the first thing you do is you, you identify those resources. And the second thing is to choose the, that IAM platform that is specific to your need. Then after you've done that, on that platform, you need to create users and group. Um, the users are going to be based on their similar assets, on the assets they actually need. So the group is going to be based on their similar assets. So let's say you have a group for administrators, right? So in administrators, you can have more than one administrator. 
let's say web, web administrator, that if you if there's any need for you to have more than one, and you can even have more than one administrator, let's say for your database, for example, there are situations whereby you can have um, like three administrators on a database, but only one has read access. Only one has write access, and only one can execute uh, software on the database. So it just depends on their needs, right? So after you've um, created, after you've created those groups, then you need to define roles for those groups and individual that you've created. So there's a role for admin. There's a role for uh, maybe the service account or a user account. Or admin for what? Admin for a particular system, or admin for a particular applications, or admin for uh, your firewall. Maybe admin for an OEM software you're using. After you've done that, you need to create uh, policies. So those policies are the rules that define what uh, users or what a group should access a particular resource and what action can perform. So that's why I see you can have more than uh, three admin. Or your database, but the their action is going to be different. What they can do on the database is going to be different. Then after you've done all that, then you want to test if your policies are actually working. So that is the way to create an IR rule, right? You identify the resources, you choose your platform, you create users and group uh, based on their needs. Then you define roles. After you define roles, then you create policies. Then you test them, right? So. It is uh, important to know that um, whenever you're setting up those rules, it depends on the platform that you want and depends on what you need that I am for. So understanding I am. So um, everybody has heard about identity before. Identity is who you are, right? And in the digital world, um, your identity can start with your username, just like your first name and your last name, last name in the physical, World. In the digital world, it starts with your username. It also goes with your name, right? Your name, your date of birth, your password, and the likes, right? So your username is going to is the one that is going to identify you to that website or that software application or that email service that you are using or you are trying to access. Most people use um, use an alias of their name for their for their username. Right, and um, most people use different things. And uh, for some platform, um, your username has to be your email address. For any platform web application, especially for web application, for any web application you sign up for, you need to choose a username, right? Which is part of who you are as a person. There are people that use one specific username for everything. That's that's one of their identity online, right? Then and they. There are two different parts of identity. The first one is um, your username. Then the second part is how you identify or how you verify that that particular identity, that particular username that um, you claim is yours. How do you verify it on that web application? How do you verify that you are the rightful owner of that username, of that particular identity? That is where your password comes in. Because you cannot use your username alone to log in to a web application. That if that web application is not vulnerable to SQL injection, where well, you need to put some SQL queries here. Yeah? But the normal way you log in is you use your username, then your password verifies that, okay, you are the rightful owner of this username. And that is where um, authentication and authorization actually comes in, right? So authentication is helping you verify your identity. Immediately you provide your username and your password, it is verifying your identity. Think of it like showing your um, driving license to prove your age. Or let's say you want to buy alcohol, you need to um, give them maybe your national ID or something that is going to prove that you are of age. So that's the same way you need to put in your username and your password to verify that particular website you're trying to gain access to the network resources. You're just proving that you are who you say you are, right? I know there are situations whereby an attacker is going to trick you into uh, phishing for your username and your password, but as long as they have it, they can authenticate as you, 
And that's where the impersonation attack comes in. In the digital world, your identity starts with your username. That's the first thing. And the second thing is um, authentication, where, where you're going to be imputing your password and the authentication system of that particular um, application is going to verify in the database that you should have access to that platform. There's also access. So um, it's actually important to understand how access works in relation to identity verification. It's very important because um, once a user has verified their identity through authentication, they are going to be granted access to the resources they need or to the sources they are requesting for. But the user is still going to have some level of access. Right. The what you can do on that web application depends on or is determined by your permission or the authorization you have on that platform. So it's the same way for people that work for organization. Um, you have ID card and uh, or badge that you need to show before you can gain access into your organization. But you can move past where your authorization stops. Because different areas in different buildings, especially for organization that has to do with critical data, right? Different areas in those buildings require different level of access. So as long as you're not a member of a particular uh, room or floor, you can't have access to that floor. In this scenario now, your ID card is what you're using to prove or what you're using to prove access to that particular resources or to that particular room or to that particular floor you want to gain access to. So in the digital world, the same principle still applies when you log into a web application with your username as your password, which is acting as your identity. The system or the network is going to check your authorization. And in the process, they're going to determine what resources you should have access to. Then what are the access you have on those resources. Are you supposed to um, modify them? Let's use e-commerce, for example. So you might be authenticated to an e-commerce site, but the only thing you'll be able to do is to view products or to buy products. That's the only thing you can do as a normal user. But an administrator or um, an, an employee that is working for that e-commerce company might be able to check your financial data or be able to check uh, some specific information about you. Yeah, this is where um, access come into play, right? So identity and uh, access management system help you manage access to different resources. So for, for any resources, there's going to be some sort of permission and authorization for each users. And what this is doing is it's helping you, is making you ensure that only authorized personnel can modify anything in your organization. As long as you don't have access to this sensitive file, or as long as you don't have access to modify it, you should not be able to modify it. Immediately you identify um, and verify yourself on the other web application you use. The next thing that comes to play is actually the access. These identification authentication are very critical concepts, especially when it comes to cyber security, because they form the foundation of many security uh, measures that organization actually apply. Um, identification refers to as um, I'm claiming to be something or to be someone. Right, that is what identification is. And authentication is um, um, confirming if that claim is actually true or false, or a system is confirming if that claim is true or false. So identification answer the question of who are you? Why authentication gives the answer, uh, as, uh, um, give the question of are you who you say you really are? So that's just the difference between um, identification and author, uh, authorization. So um, a simple example of um, identification and authorization is um, when you go to purchase stuff, um, maybe um, anything you purchase online, or maybe you um, 
go to a store to get something that you really need, you are using your card to pay for that uh, particular item, right? But that card still requires like a PIN. That's your personal identification number. So when you use your card to make that purchase, you are making a claim that you are the person that owns that card. And that is identification. But claiming that you are the person that owns that card is not enough to complete that transaction. You still need to be able to authenticate it, right? The system needs to authenticate your identity to ensure that you are that person. And to authenticate your identity, you need to put in your PIN number that is associated with that card. So that is where authentication comes to play. This, the principle of um, identification and authentication applies to cybersecurity measures too. There are some, um, for instance, let's say, let's say whenever you log into your computer system, um, you need to, before you log in, that's for people that have username and password sent for their uh, PC. So let me just leave your PC open. You need to put in your username, then you need to provide your password. Your username is your identification. Your password is your authentication. That is going to prove that you really know the uh, username or you're the one that really owns the username and password to the system, right? So identification and authentication are key concepts in cyber security. And um, we need to really put it at the back of our mind, right? So when we are providing our username to log into a specific resource, that is identification, then our password is what is authenticating us to gain access to that particular resource. As I said earlier, authentication is a process of verifying one's identity, right? So the identity might be for a user or for your network device, right? And there are a lot of approach um, to authentication. So there are a lot of ways you can actually prove that you are the owner or you can prove the legitimacy to a particular device or an application, right? Uh, the first thing is um, something you know. So something you know is like your username or your password, right? Or your PIN. Those, um, the PIN and the password now is, an, is a part of something you know. This um, something you know, this, this first factor is actually using mostly online banking. It's using, um, maybe you have like a guest list of somebody, so, so people that is supposed to attend an location. And for every guest list, everybody has a unique ID. So that ID can be used to grant you access to into the building. Yeah, so that, that's something you know. So the second factor is something you are. So something you has to do with our body, uh, body physique, our biomet biometric characteristic, how we walk our fingerprints, our the iris scan, facial recognition. There are a lot of um, devices that use uh, of uh, uh, fingerprint and facial recognition nowadays, even our systems, right? So that's something to do. Uh, it has to do with something on your body, right? Then the third part or the third factor is something you have. So something you have can be your ID card, can be your smart card, can be like security token. And um, something how you have is commonly used to assess uh, buildings or to assess organizations or a particular part or a particular section of an organization. Then um, there's also something you do. So something you do has to do with your signature. It has to do with your signature. Um, though this factor is not usually using authentication, but in organizations, they actually use it. For every mail you send, there has to be a signature that is very fine when you see who you are. Or it's not always used as authentication, right? Then um, there are five factors. The last one is uh, where you are, right? So let's say you have a network resources that um, the only people that are supposed to log in or connect to that network resources are people from the USA. Then you have somebody trying to connect from um, China or from, from the UK or from Canada. So that is where, where that's where the fifth factor, that's where you are, that's where it comes to play. So um, 
is mostly used to restrict access to certain resources based on user location. So when you are setting up um, products or uh, maybe you're trying to set up your network, after, after adding security to your facility design, you've done all that, now you're building applications or you're setting IAM or you are creating different sector in the organization, you need to know the kind of the best kind of authentication mechanism you need to set for each sector or for each application. Some softwares or some components need more than one factor, right? Like um, your or online banking now, right? You can use uh, something, something you know, that's your password, that's your PIN. You can also use something you have. And instead of using your password, you can connect your facial recognition or your fingerprint. And you can also use something you have. So for online banking application, you can use your username and password to lock it or your fingerprint. But there are some, you can set up your account in a way that you can't carry out any transaction if you don't have a security token, right? So is that a security token that you have? After you um, initiated the transaction, you have to put in that token to confirm that transaction. So there are situations whereby you might need to do more than one factor, right? And what more than one factor is helping you do is the more difficult uh, or the more factor you have, the more difficult it's going to be for an unauthenticated, unauthenticated user or an attacker to actually gain access to that network resources. Um, so um, authentication is authentication factors. That's um, something you are, something you know, something you have, something you do, and where you are uh, important aspects of um, cyber security, especially when it comes to uh, setting up network security or setting up anything in the organization. Right, you want to make sure that you're using the right authentication mechanism and you're using more than one factor for um for critical application or for critical components in your organization. We have the multi-factor authentication. Um so multi-factor authentication is another security measure that you can use. Um so what multi-factor authentication is doing is it's combining multi-factor to verify a user. Right, it's not just using your username and your password alone. It's also using another thing, another uh, maybe a token, right, to verify um, a user. Adding MFA or multi-factor authentication to um, your processes or to your development or to the application that you use to carry out your business processes or your normal banking application is helping you provide an additional layer of security. Because what that simply means is that even if an attacker have access to your username and your password, as long as they don't have that MFA, they would not be able to steal your money. They will not be able to send anything out of your money. They will not even be able to gain access to your, um, your banking application or your mobile application or any type of web application at all that you're using the MFA for. So there's a type of MFA called the 2FA. So the 2FA is um, it's using two factors for authentication. It's not just using one. That's like having security over layer over another security layer, right? So what two factor is helping you do is, uh, for example, let's say you log into your email account from a new device. So you may be prompted to enter a password. That's something you know. And immediately enter that password, you receive a verification code. That's another layer of security. That's something you have on your phone to verify that okay, you are the owner of that email address, right? So uh, MFA and 2FA are actually critical security measures that you need to use, especially for banking application and maybe your official emails. You can also use them for your personal emails. Right. It's important to have more than one authentication factor on your uh, personal applications also. So because it's going to help you reduce the risk of data theft, um, any breaches or 
um, sensitive information being stolen or being accessed uh, by unauthorized user or attacker. So um, there's something called mutual authentication. So let's say your company's website, right? It allows um, customers to log in and access the account. But you want to make uh, you want to make sure that that process is extremely secure, right? So there are two ways you can do it. The first way is just to use one-way authentication. That is, you're using your username and your password to gain access to that um, asset on that server. That's the one way. But the problem with one way is that you can be vulnerable to impersonation attack because um, there are so many techniques and attacker you can use to get your username and your password. And that is where mutual authentication comes to play. So now with mutual authentication, it's not only your clients that is authenticating to the server, the server is also authenticating to the client. So it's like a seen, seen ACK, ACK um, packets, like, like you're trying to start a TCP connection whereby you need to send uh, a synchronized message to the server server is going to respond with synchronize and then send back in an ACK back to the client. So it's a two way, which means that when a customer visits that website, right, the server, the website server is going to print, is going to give um, the customer a digital certificate on their browser that they can verify. So this digital certificate is going to contain information that is going to tell the clients that or the server that okay yes they are who they say they are after um that has been done then the customer browser can now verify that the digital certificate is offered or is issued by a trusted uh CE, that is a certificate authority and the digital certificate is not a forged one and what this is also helping the customer to do is, is helping the customer make sure that they are actually um, interacting with the legitimate websites and not a fake one because there are situations whereby, especially organization, large organization, whenever there wants to be a phishing campaign, um, Anasaka, Anasaka is going to go for one particular network resource, maybe a web application. And if, if they are going for uh, credential addressing, they might um, clone your domain name. Use your domain name to post a that same application. Maybe they create like a clone of that application and then use it to uh, send out phishing emails. So for anybody that falls a victim, they will be able to get their username and their password. With um, the mutual authentication mechanism, it's going to provide an extra layer of security, right? So even if um, uh, so in that situation now, so even if the attacker cloned your website, right, your client is not going to very like because the digital certificate of that website is going to be different from the legitimate one. So mutual authentication now is helping the user by protecting them, them against impersonation attack because the client and the server has to claim um, to be who they claim to be. We have it's not the server alone that is authenticated now the client also is authenticated right so that is just um the importance of um the mutual authentication we've come across so many so many um ways of identification and, and authentication method right um you use them every day to gain access to systems to your personal mobile phones to your web application and the likes right uh, but we still need to just we still need to talk about um, the common ones, which is the password, the biometric, and um, the advert tokens. So the password are the most used one. Everybody has a password for one application they run, right? And um, what that simply means is that whenever you want to log into an application, you need to provide some key or a combination of character that only you know or that you save somewhere. Maybe using the password manager or you're like me that use a phrase, right? So in this method of authentication, 
um, the user is going to be verified and authenticated by the password they, they input in. So this is how um, communication or authentication works. So, um, so you're using your browser to gain access to the database. And we have the APIs. The APIs are just like the, the messenger, right? That's the one fetching information for you, right? So you impute your username and your password in here in the client. The API is going to take it to the database, and this is what, it, what is happening in the database. So the way the database are, um, are structured is depending on the kind of database you're using. There are different types of database. Um, there's SQL, MySQL, there's a the Microsoft SQL, uh, there's a relational database that is in MySQL, there's a non-relational database, there's the unstructured one, and there's the blockchain database, right? So it depends, it doesn't matter the kind of database you use. The way username and password are stored in your database is stored in ashes. So it's not stored in clear text. Right. So your username might be stored in clear text, but your password is always stored in hashes. It's stored in hashes. So immediately you put in your username and your password. So what these APIs are doing is they are carrying this information to the database. The immediately you are putting your password. The password is converting it to the hash that is supposed to be on this database. Is not um, comparing your main password, but it's only comparing the hashes. And we're not talking about database security, but even if um, your it depends on the kind of encryption you're using. Let's say for SHA 256. Even if you are using SHA 256 to save password in your database, you still need there are situations whereby if you want to do more database security, you still need to do something like sorting on those hashes. So when you solve those hashes, one password, let's say with me and you, we are using similar password now, they're going to still have different hashes on the database. Let's say my password is password one, two, three. So this is how my password is going to be saved on the database. So this is how it is going to be saved on the database, right? But another person can also have password one, two, three, right? So if there's an hashing on this, um, on this Chateau of six hash, the hash is going to be totally different. So let's say this user is, um, so even if Joseph and Tina has, is, they're using the same password, their hash is going to be different. It's going to be totally different from each other. And that is where salting comes into play. Well, that's for database security, right? So back to what we're talking about. So the, the APIs are the one that is going to authenticate the database to check if your username and your password is correct. And they are uh, validating your ashes, not the main password, right? Then if it's correct, you have access to the server. If not, they're going to tell you that the username and your password is not correct. So um, password is an important um, mechanism uh, or method when it comes to identification and authentication and is the most used one. Then there is the biometric, right? Um, the biometric is actually using your um, unique physical characteristics. That is your thumbprint, your fingerprint, your iris, maybe your iris pattern, your movements, if you have like a motion detector system, then maybe your facial recognition. Facial recognition is the most uh, popular one, and fingerprint, right? So they are more secure than the password because what that simply means is that before you can even have access to uh, a particular network resource, you need to be able to have the physical look of the person that has been programmed inside. There are different types of biometric, right? 
the effect of biometric there is um, one biometric method called the permanence. Right. So what permanence is doing is um, it just refers to the idea that that biometric data that you're using for one person is going to remain over time. That's what you're going to be using. You will not, you will not have to change it over time. Let's say for organization now that use a um, fingerprint scanning as biometric authentication, right? So you don't have to keep changing your fingerprint every day, right? But and permanence also has issues because there are situations whereby you would want to use your fingerprint and you will not be able to gain access. Maybe uh, uh, something happened. Maybe there's something a cut on your finger or something. And what the system has in, in its memory is the pattern of your fingerprint. So the system might not be able to remember it, right? That's for permanence. There's also one called um, um, the false rejection rate. So false rejection rate is just like an additional security mechanism that is being uh, programmed in biometric um application or softwares right which means that um, you need to have some you need to be able to um incorrectly then put in your biometric right for example let's say an organization use uh, let's say let's use a facial recognition this time right to control a specific area maybe like a secured area in an organization so if um, you try your facial recognition, um, the biometric system has a cap to the amount of time you can put your uh, maybe fake, I don't know. That's, I don't know the situation whereby the situation that can actually make somebody's face to change, but you are going to get delayed even if you have um, the uh, necessary authentication to that um to that particular net of resources right so when um you're choosing your biometric you really need to have a lot of consideration in mind you need to really understand biometric and the different um uh, the different components and how they really work right you need to buy the one that is going to help you ensure accuracy and you need to be also be able to buy uh, a biometric system that is reliable, right? Because the main aim of organization investing in security mechanism like that is for them to have like a better experience and a better security for their authorized users. So organization also needs to put um, perform, uh, uh, permanence and false rejection rate in mind when choosing biometric. Then um, there's the hardware token uh, that you can use. Hardware token, uh, um, okay. So apart from hardware token, there's also hardware that you can actually use, right? That's your smart card or your USB token, right? Those are hardware that you can use. So the people that use that most often are governmental and military organization because they require like some a high level of security, then an organization also use it. Right? So you might need to have that card to be able to assess a particular area, maybe an investigation area, maybe uh, a cell or something. So it depends on the sector you are playing, right? Then we have the token. So there's hardware token, the software token. Right. So what token system is just doing is it's generating password for you every few minutes or no, every few seconds. I think 60 seconds, some some are less than 60 seconds, some 30 seconds. So immediately you use your username and your password to access a network resources. You still need to put in that one-time password. Right. And if you don't put in that one-time password on time you are not going to get authenticated. And that's why it has information on it. 
So um, yeah, I know there are some hardware tokens for bank, mobile application, for financial applications. Then there's the software one. Everybody knows Google the Authenticator, right? Google Authenticator is a hardware, um, to, uh, sorry, is a software to token. Then we have the key fob for the hardware one. So yeah, um, you just need to understand um, different uh, common identification that you can actually use or you can add um, to your portfolio, to your asset, to your list of assets to protect your um, your financial application, your organization data, and to also make sure that uh, an unauthenticated user cannot have access to those resources. So author authorization and access control. So there are also important concepts in cybersecurity, authorization and access control. Most of this time, I know they look uh, really similar, but they're really different. So um, they have to do with managing access to network resources and data. So for access control, access control are used to protect resources from unauthorized access. And they're making sure that it's only authorized users that can access them, right? So they are hand in hand, right? Um, we, we actually interact with access control every day, right? For example, when you want to go to work tomorrow now, you need to go to your car, you need to start your car, you use a key to start your car. So your key now is an access control, right? As long as um, nobody has access to that key, they can't start your car, right? There are some other cars that uses a um, RFID that you don't even need to start the car. All you need to do is make sure that the RFID is close to um, your car. They are like, um, they are more like certificates. They're like certificates identifiers. Right, that is being stored in a car key. So immediately, those car key is close to your car, you'll be able to turn on your car, right? Aside from that, you also use that your access control at your place of work also. Before you go in, depending on where you work, if it's a large organization, you might need to verify yourself with an ID card or a badge. Right, so your badge or your ID card is acting like the physical credential that is going to give you access to that building. And it's not just giving you access to that building, it's giving you access to where you're supposed to be. And that's where access control comes, comes into play, right? A, an employee might not have access to every part of the organization. And that thing is, so when you, when, um, You've given you've been given access access to the building and you want to start working. Let's say you, you use a PC to work, you need to log into your computer, right? That's another form of um, access control. So this, this, this is an example of logical access control, right? You need to verify your identity before you be able to have access to that network resources. Right. So access control. Um, and authorization are important in an organization because um, they're helping you protect um, your network resources, your local resources. Um, they, they had like a, an extra layer of security on every of your assets, right? Whether physical or virtual, right? And this is going to help you prevent unauthorized access and also help you from uh, data breaches and cyber attacks. And now to implement access control. Um, so how to implement access control actually depend on what you want to manage or what you're trying to regulate access to, right? But there are two types. There's the access control list. Um, there's also the capability. So this file system access control, access control list, they are under access control, right? So access control lists, uh, they are used to implement access control as part of um, this, uh, an application or, or an operating system. 
right, or like an infrastructure, right? So access control list is going to like have information about all the employee and um, the level of access they should have in that organization or in that infrastructure or on that system. So you might you might be given a company system and you don't even have admin access to it. That is the importance of access control or access control list, right? Then, for example, let's say um, um, you're managing files in the computer system. So you can use uh, the file system access control list to define the level of access different users. Let's say you create like four users on your PC. Uh, maybe other people also use your PCs to carry out some activity or to work, right? You want to have uh, the level of access they should have on your PC, right? So on a PC, um, the highest permission you can have on the PC is um, read, write, and and execute. So implementing access control is one of the most important part of an organization, right? Because you really don't want everybody to have access to your uh, resources, even as an employee. There has to be some level of access. What do you need to do your carry out your business processes? Or what do you need to do your to your to carry out your job function? What kind of access do you need? Is it real access you need? Do you need to modify anything? Right. So system administrators are always in charge of regulating access to resources most of the time. Well, it still depends on the structure of the organization and how big your organization is. All right, then uh, implementing access control. So there's also network access control. And um, what this access control is helping you do is it's helping you filter um, network communications or transactions, right? For a machine to communicate to a network, you need to have an IP address. You are using your IP address to interact with that network, right? The same way an attacker will use your IP address to interact with that network. So, but having like a network access control list, you can um, you can put restrictions on the type of IP address that is coming in your organization. So, for cyber defense analysts or professionals, they have some platform they go to to get the list of malicious IP address over the last few months or over the last week. So those malicious at, at, uh, IP address, maybe they are IP address of C2 servers or malicious attackers that has been carrying out some different um, engagement or attack on some form of on some sort of organization. So I can go look for those IP address, then blacklist those IP address using my access control list. If I blacklist those IP address, you will not, as an attacker, you will not be able to use the IP address to connect or to reach uh, my network assets again. But there's a twist to that. That's like, it's very easy. Um, the way attackers work is they don't have just one server. They have multiple servers. They pay for um, secrets. I'm not calling them secrets, but um, private hosting servers or service. Right. So what those people do is they are protecting your information. So if you're hosting your application with them, uh, even if it's a malicious application, they don't care. What they do is they take care of your uh, your KYC, your information, your personal information. They are not going to release your information to anybody, even um, even law enforcement agencies. Right and most attackers use those kind of platform to host their city servers, to host their arsenals that they use to attack other organizations. So even if you block their IP address today, they are going to spin up another server to use to attack you tomorrow. But overall, um, having um, network access control is actually crucial, crucial for organization because it's going to help you a lot. Uh, it's going to present a case now service because you're blacklisting the IP address already, uh, or any type of unrestricted packet that you don't want to come into your organization. You can also use it to limit the type of traffic that comes into your organization, where the traffic is coming from. 
right? The traffic, what uh, IP address should have access to these particular resources. Right. So um, network access control is really important to protect your internal assets or your cloud assets, depending on where um, you host your infrastructure on. So that's one of the setbacks of just having an access control list. Because if if you have an access control list and in your access control, you just want people from USC to connect to it. Like most, uh, most um, application developer does that. There are some application you can't use if you're out of the USA. You can't even install them, especially on Apple, on iPhones, right? If you're not from USA, you can't install them, but I can just get uh, a Apple device then use a VPN to log into Apple, then create an identity for myself in the US. Then I can use that to log into that Google phone and still use that credential to access to the application. So there are a lot of bypass to it when it comes to access control. Right? Um, access control model. Um, so access control model is like a framework, um, like a methodology that is used to manage and enforce access to resources. Right? So um, there are different kinds of access control. And the model is just helping us uh, with guidelines and procedures for controlling who has access to these resources or all to a particular resources and the type of action they can perform on that resources. And also under what circumstances should access be granted or denied to them. So that's what access control model is doing. So access control model is um, just a way of ensuring that the right people that have access to the, have access to the right resources. All right. So we have different one. Uh, we have um, the discretional, which is the first one. So in a discretional access control model. So the owner of the resources is the one that is going to determine who can have access to it, and what other people can do to it. That is in the case of the folder example that I gave the other time. If you have more than one user, you as the owner of that PC can set permission for each users on your PC. Now, the permission that depends on you if you want them to be able to edit or delete files or read files. But the problem with discretionary access control is most times, um, users or owners may not uh, make the best decision, right? Or they might um, be careless with their maybe username and password, their mode of authentication, right? Then an attacker, an attacker is going to gain access to their credentials. And if an attacker can gain access to their credentials and they don't have like an MFA or any other part of um, authentication, other mechanism to authenticate, the attacker is going to gain access to all their resources. So that's just the downside to discretionary access control because you as the user is the one, you are the one that is um, putting those restrictions. So the mandatory access control um, is the system that is determining the access, right? So it's just like um, a contract, right? is based on the predefined rule. A contract is an agreement between two people, right? We have a rule on the contract, right? So the contract is stating that this, this and this should be done when this and this is put in place. That's what contract was, right? That's a predefined rule. So that's what mandatory access control is using. So the rules are set by your administrator or any other person that has high level security security clearance in an organization, right? So those kind of resources, normal users don't have access to those kind of resources, right? The system is the one that is going to enforce those, uh, those uh, access based on the security label that is assigned to that particular resource. Then there's the role base. So the role base is determined by your role in an organization. What kind of role do you have in the organization, right? 
are you a child then a child should only have access to um, a child portal then for let's say for a doc for an, uh, an hospital now a doctor is going to have access to uh, maybe a uh, patient emr right but they might not even have access to um, modify so the lab attendant or anybody that's carrying out the test is the one that has access to impute or change or add new test results then you as a doctor what you just need to do is just to view those um electrical medical records right so if based on your role what kind of role do you have in our organization that's why it's called role-based access control then we have the attribute based access control um is the attribute based as control is based on some set of attributes or the characteristic of a user or the characteristic of the resources itself so the characteristic or the attribute might be maybe your job title uh it might be the department at which you play or your location or the time of the day you're accessing accessing that particular resources right so there's also the multi-level access. This has to do with um, access to sensitive information. So you need to have like a security clearance for you to have access to that kind of um, resource, right? So that's just the difference between the discretionary. The discretionary, you as the user, you're the one that's implemented access control. For mandatory is the system or the administrator that is, um, um, putting the access control in place based on set of predefined rules, right? There's a role base, which has to do with um, the kind of role you have in an organization. There's the attribute base, which has to do your job title, um, your department, the location, or time of the day. Then there's the multi-level access. The multi-level access has to do um, with the sensitivity of the resource you are trying to gain access to.